This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 8th chapter of Romans beginning with verse 31. As Paul asks four questions. The first question he asks is, what shall we say to these things? What things? Well, first of all, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with us all so freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. God is for me. I like to personalize that. Paul said, if God be for us, but I like to personalize it because so often, it seems, we have difficulty personalizing the Scriptures. We can sit here with God's people and we can say, God is for us. And in our mind, we can look around and say, yeah, all those wonderful people, God surely for them, but I don't know if He's for me or not. Because I have failed Him. I have messed up again, you know, and, and I don't know if God is for me. I can believe that God is for us, but I don't know if He's for me. And so I like to personalize that, and I like to say, God is for me. Now, for years, I did not realize this. In fact, I imagined that God was against me. I grew up in church in Sunday school from the time I was able to sit I was put in a Sunday school classroom and I learned well the lesson that Jesus loves me I used to sing Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me Jesus loves me, you know, all of the things in the Bible I see, this is the dearest that Jesus loves me, and Jesus loves me, this I know. I, I knew that. But in spite of the fact that I knew that he loved me, I always imagined that somehow he was against me. Because I came to believe that he only loved me when I was good. And that was less than 50% of the time. So... Part of the time he loved me, but most of the time he could hardly tolerate me. In fact, he was wanting to have a good excuse to somehow get rid of me because I was an embarrassment and a shame to him. I always felt that God was condemning me. And because I felt that God was condemning me, I was thus condemning myself. I knew what I should be doing. I even desired to do what I should be doing. But I couldn't always put it together. And I was often doing those things that I didn't want to do spiritually. And I often was not doing those things that I did want to do spiritually. I was in the same boat as Peter in that my spirit indeed was willing, but my flesh was weak. And so to will was with me, but how to, to perform the will I couldn't find. And thus, because I wasn't doing what was right and often doing what was wrong, I felt that God was constantly condemning me and I felt this constant condemnation as a child growing up. I called often for the mercy of God. It's because I did not understand the grace of God. God is for me. Now that's in spite of the fact that he knows me completely. He knows my strengths and my weaknesses. He knows my defeat and my victories. He knows my failures. And still, God loves me and is for me. Now, he asked the question, 
If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, for one, Satan can be against us and is against us. The Bible calls him the adversary, your adversary, the devil. And Satan is a very powerful adversary and foe. It's interesting to me that one of the chief weapons that he used against me was that God wasn't for me. He was constantly telling me that. He was constantly saying, hey, you have no right asking God for help. Look how you just failed him. God doesn't want anything to do with you. He's tired of your failures. He's sick of you. He's through with you. You might as well forget it. And he was constantly seeking to discourage me from coming to God by convincing me that God was against me, not for me. He would point out my sins, my failures, my faults, and unfortunately I gave him plenty of material to work with. And I was convinced that I really had no right to come to God to seek the blessing of God upon my life because I had failed God so consistently. Satan is against me, seeking to destroy my relationship with God, seeking to keep me from those blessings that God wants to bestow upon me because he is for me and loves me. Who can be against me? Well, people are often against me. I get my share of hate mail every week. The threatening calls, death threats and so forth. The Bible said, if I please all men, I don't have that problem. It says, I'm not a servant of Christ. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. I don't care what you do. There are certain people that just aren't going to like you. That's just the way life is. My little granddaughter is two years old and going through what is commonly termed the terrible twos. Now, I don't know what happens at two years old, how a little angel can suddenly be transformed <laughs> into something other than an angel. But in this two-year-old state, as we are carrying her through the store or something, and there will be some little boy that will say hi or smile, she'll say, I don't like you. And people will come up and say, oh, what a pretty little girl. And she'll say, I don't like you. <laughs> and she even says to me oftentimes, I don't like you, Grandpa. <laughs> now, I know that she doesn't mean that. But it's just, you know, that being two years old. Well, unfortunately, some people never grow out of the terrible twos. And they spend their entire life making snap to ju judgments on people and they're just saying, I don't like you. You know, I really feel sorry for people who are terribly good looking. Because, you know, if you're really beautiful, people are going to hate you just because you're beautiful and they're not. I feel sorry for people who just by their beauty can arouse the ire or the I don't like yous of others. So it doesn't matter if you're beautiful or ugly or if you're sweet or mean, you're going to find that there is a certain segment of people that just don't like you. David was constantly talking about my enemies. And he was constantly talking about my foes. 
that have risen against me. Enemies and foes, we all have them. And not always of our own making, but yet they are there. Just because I'm me and you're you. People are against me sometimes. But I also find that oftentimes circumstances seem to be against me. I can get so pressed by the circumstances of my life. Oh, how the circumstances of life can sometimes just weigh us down. I get to the place where I cannot see any possible solution. I can't see any way out of this problem. It seems that I'm almost overwhelmed and overcome by the circumstances of life, and our circumstances can often be against us. Now, these are all formidable foes. Hey, it's tough when Satan is against you. He's a very powerful enemy. It's tough to have people who have conspired against you or who just don't like you and are seeking somehow to see your demise and would rejoice in it. It's not easy when circumstances begin to mount against a person. And these can all be very formidable foes. And if I just looked at those things which were against me, I think I'd just go sit in a hole and say, Lord, cover me over and let me die. Because there are powerful forces against me. But oh, thank God, He's for me. And when I realize that God is for me, then all of a sudden I realize that all of the forces combined that are against me are nothing. Nothing to fear, nothing to worry about because God is for me. David said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what my enemies shall do unto me. God is for me. Oh, I see the forces against me. I put them in a balance and the thing bottoms out and just sits on the bottom. I think, oh, I'll never make it. Look at all of this which is against me. But then I put on the other side, God is for me and hey, the thing bottoms out the other way because all of the forces that are against me are nothing to be compared with God who is for me. He is greater, stronger, more powerful than all of the forces or powers that might be against me. God is for me. Now, how can I know that God is for me? I know he might be for you, but how can I know he's for me? Paul asks a second question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I know that God is for me because I see what God has demonstrated his willingness to give for me. He spared not his own son. Isaiah promised that unto us a child would be born, unto us a son would be given, and the government would be upon his shoulders, and his name would be called the Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there would be no end. Unto us a son is given. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I believe that to God, the most valued treasure that he had was his son, his relationship with his son. We often hear the question asked, what do you give to the person who has everything? 
And that is a difficult problem. My wife doesn't have it. <laughs> Another question might also be asked, what do you give to show you love when you have everything? What could God give to show you that he loves you? Now man places a determined value upon gold because of its rarity. We know that there is only a certain amount of gold that exists on the earth. And thus it is a precious metal, it is a rare metal, and thus we have determined a value on gold, which is only a determined value by man. It's not an intrinsic value, it's a determined value on gold. If you were starving to death out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, having discovered the richest gold vein in the world and sitting on it, but lost and starving, all of that gold is going to be meaningless because it doesn't have any value as far as food, as far as your present need. It's a value that man has determined because of its rarity. But where did the gold come from? God created it. If God created a little gold, he could create a lot of gold. He could create all the gold he wants. I do believe that when you do get to heaven and the angel is taking you on the universal tour, true universal tour, <laughs> that the angel will be announcing, and now we are coming to the golden galaxy. It's one of the largest galaxies in the universe. Every star, planet, satellite within this galaxy is of solid gold. For God could create a whole golden galaxy just as easily as he could create the galaxy out of the various elements that we know exist in ours. Scientists do theorize that there are entire galaxies of diamonds. I believe that. Scientists have now theorized that. The astronomers, astrophysicists, believe that there are Galactic diamonds in the universe. So God really couldn't show his love by giving you gold because, well, one thing you'll discover when you get to heaven, it's used for asphalt. You know, it's, it's sort of overwhelming to prize something so great and then just to see so much, you realize, hey, this little thing I have is nothing. You know, I've been holding on to this cougaran. And I get to heaven and I look around and here are streets of gold. I was told of a lady several years ago, because I was a child when I was told it, who was moving from the east to California. And she had shipped out most of her things, and she was coming out by train. And so she brought with her from her home in the east one of her most cherished possessions, a geranium that she had been nurturing for years in her window. Her neighbors used to come and see the blossoms on her geranium and they were all amazed that she was able to culture that geranium in that climate and was so proud of this geranium that she carried it on her lap all the way on the train from her home in the east to carefully protect it so that she could have her geranium when she got to California. When the train pulled into the station in Pasadena, it used to be, if some of you can remember that many years ago, uh, that in the train station in Pasadena, they used to have ivy geranium growing all over the walls. The whole place, you just pull in and the whole place is covered, ivy geranium all over the place. 
And as the train pulled into Pasadena and she looked out and saw this ivy geranium growing all over the walls like it was growing wild, she took her pot and threw it out the window. <laughs> all of a sudden that which was so valuable and prized to her was of no more value. It's so common here in California. And so those things that we prize and value so highly would be meaningless for God to give to show He loves because it is so plentiful with Him. But God wanted to show you that He loved you and so He spared not His own Son but delivered Him up for us all. The word delivered is a word that refers to the cross. He delivered him unto the cross to die. Now I can understand God sending his son to reign over man. I have difficulty realizing the depth of love that would send a son to die for man. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son as the propitiation for our sins. For one might die for a righteous man, yet peradventure for a good man some might even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, Paul is giving you a comparison here. If God spared not his own son, if God already demonstrated his willingness to give to you that which he prized most highly, that which he valued above everything else, and yet God, because he loved you so much, was willing to deliver his son for you, how much more then will he not freely give you all things? Today we look at our needs and we think, oh, it's overwhelming. Oh, I can never do it. Oh, no one can help me. I'm too far down and all. And, and we look at our needs and we, and, and we just become despairing because of the greatness of our need. But if we look at what God has already supplied and showed his willingness to give for you, you realize that what you need is nothing in comparison to what God has already demonstrated his willingness to give because he loves you. God is for me. God loves me. He has demonstrated that love by showing his willingness to deliver his son for my sins. Thus, I have no problem thinking, oh, my need is even too great for God. Or I don't know if God is willing to give this to me because he's already demonstrated his willingness to give all for me. The next question, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who's going to charge me with my guilt? Who's going to file the charges against me? Again, the question is who? And the answer comes back, Satan. Satan is always charging me. The Bible says that he is the accuser of the brethren and he accuses them before God day and night continually. You remember in the book of Job where the sons of God were presenting themselves to God and Satan also came with him? And the Lord said, hey, where you been? You know, I'm cruising around the world, going up and down to and fro through it. And God said, have you scrutinized my servant Job? Hey, he's a good man. Upright. He loves good. He hates evil. And Satan said, yeah, but you've put a hedge around that guy. You've protected him from me. And you've blessed him. Hey, he's one of the wealthiest guys around. He's got anything he could desire. Anybody would bless you and serve you if you load all that loot on him. Hey, let me take away his riches and all. And that man will just curse you to his face. He was accusing Job of being a mercenary, only serving God for the prophet. He's the accuser of the brethren, making accusations. 
against us. Who is he that shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Satan does. <laughs> but you know, it was years, years before I realized that God wasn't making out charges against me. It was years before I realized that God didn't have a list checking it twice to find out who was naughty and nice. And here Paul answers his question, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And he answers this question, it is God who is justified. In other words, God isn't laying anything to my charge. As David cried in Psalm 32, Oh, how happy is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. God's not laying things to my charge. For God has declared me innocent of all charges. Because Jesus took those charges that were against me and took the punishment of those charges and died in my place. Even as in the Old Testament, they would put the guilt of their sins upon the animal and the animal would die in their place. So my guilt was placed upon Jesus. He died in my place and God has declared me innocent of all charges. It is God who has justified me. And it's so glorious that God has declared me innocent of all charges. So Satan is up there trying to make his charges. God said, he's innocent. <laughs> yeah, but look what he did. He's innocent. I love it. Innocent before God. He has justified me because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Being justified through faith in him. Last question. Who is he that condemneth? Oh, oh, oh. Satan is always condemning me. Always condemning me. Always telling me how unworthy I am. Always telling me what a failure I am. Always telling me how hopeless I am. Now he has some help from people too. And People have condemned me. But you know what? The one who really counts isn't condemning me. Who is he that condemneth? Though Satan may condemn, though others may condemn, and to be honest, I often condemn myself. Oh, I can't do anything right. <laughs> Why do I always mess up, you know? And I condemn myself. But to me, the glorious truth is that Jesus does not condemn me. But rather, he died for me and rose again and is even at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. Not condemning me, interceding for me. He is not there as my adversary. He's there as my advocate. Representing me. Interceding for me. Oh, what a glorious day in my Christian experience when I realized that God was for me. He gave his son for me. He's not laying anything to my charge or against me, but has justified me. And that Jesus is there interceding. Hey, I've got the Father working for me, the Son working for me, the Spirit working for me. How can I lose? God is for you today. This transformed my relationship from, with God from a yo-yo believer to one of constant, continual victory and joy. Doesn't mean I don't fail. Doesn't mean I don't sin. It means 
that I'm not separated from God's love ever. Because of his love for me and his provision through Jesus Christ, my Lord. God wants you to experience the blessings of his love and his grace towards you through Jesus Christ. For God is for you. Though the world be against you, God is for you. Though the whole world be encamped against me, the Lord is on my side. I shall not fear what my enemies might be able to do. He takes up the part for his children. And he'll take up the part for you. I don't care what those circumstances are. God is for you. He's more than capable. And has demonstrated his willingness. O oh, child of God, rejoice. Go forth in victory today. The Lord is for you. He loves you. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. What shall we say to these things? God, what can we say? We're speechless before such love and grace. We don't know what to say, Father, to express our gratitude and our appreciation. Words seem so trite and inadequate, Lord. You're so good. You love us so much. And though we have failed and though our love has been hot and cold, yet, Lord, your love has never altered, it's never changed. It endures all things. It overcomes all obstacles. It touches our hearts today. And Lord, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. If ever I were prone or given to shouting praises and glory unto God, it would be in Romans chapter 8. When I get to these questions that Paul asked, if God be for us, who can be against us? If he has spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more then shall he not freely give us all things? Who is he that shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's justified. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who has died, yea, rather risen again, even at the right hand of the right. Oh, man, I could get to shouting over this. This glorious relationship that I have, this sure relationship that I have, this unchanging relationship that I have with God because it's premised not upon my faithfulness or my goodness, but upon his faithfulness and his goodness, and thus it's a sure covenant and relationship. And I get to thinking about it, and I could just shout, praise God. Hallelujah. I just, um, well, I'm sort of like the old fellow down in the south who uh, used to get in these shouting gigs in church every once in a while, and they got a new minister fresh out of seminary, and as he started to preach his sermon, he came to a good point, and this guy just started shouting and praising the Lord. Hallelujah! Bless God! Glory to the Lord! And, and it so discomfited this pastor that he just lost his text. He lost his message. He just was wiped out. You know, he couldn't recover. And after this had happened for three or four Sundays, and the guy had messed up a bunch of good sermons, the pastor said to his deacons, all right, fellas, I want you to go out and talk to old Farmer Brown, and I want you to tell him to cease and desist. I just can't handle this shouting. I just, uh, it just it causes me to lose myself, and I just, uh, I just can't handle it. I become a basket case by the time he's through. So the deacons went out to visit Farmer Brown to talk to him about his shouting in church, and as 
they came crawling through the barbed wire fence where he was out plowing with his mule there in the field. He called his mule to a halt. He reined him back and he waited for them to come up. And he said, eh, fellas, I know what you're here for. He says, uh, I realize that my shouting is bothering the new preacher. And he said, I, I, I've determined in my heart I'm not going to shout anymore. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to not do it. I, I know it's bothering him, and I don't want to bother him, and I just determined I'm not going to do it. He says, but then I get to sit in there in church. And he said, I, I begin to think about how good God has been to me. He said, I think about this nice little farm I have here. He said, I think about this old mule that just is so good at plowing. And I, and I think about my wife and my children. And I think about all the blessings that God... He said, would you guys hold these mules so I could just shout here a minute, you know. <laughs> you know, you start thinking about what God has done. It's hard to restrain the goodness of God. He loves me. He's for me. He's going to bring me into his eternal abode that I might enjoy his love and his goodness world without end. My future is secure in the love of God. Oh, how grateful I am. If I keep going, I'm going to shout. So <laughs> God be with you and bless you. Keep you in his love. May you just experience this week fresh little nuances of the grace of God towards you as he demonstrates over and over again his eternal love through Jesus our Lord.